tau ha faka tau ko rangi nui e tui honei ka tau ha faka tau ko papa tui nu pu e ta ko tua kenei ka tau ha faka tau ko te matu mai ra roto na kui a ru kui a manua pau roto kui a ru kui a manua pau ko kia tina faka tina te mōre i hoa i ki e pupu ana hoki a wawa u ana hoki tāre wa tū ki te rangi Eke pānuku ki a eke eke tangaro Tau mai te mauri, hau ie, hui e, tāi ki e E ngā mani ngā reo e ngā kāranga ranga ramaha O te motu, o te whare wānau o tākau ki pōneke Mai tū tere mō ana ki rangi tuhi Mai rangi tuhi Tuhi ki fiti reia, waka fiti atu, ki ahu mairangi, ki mā tairangi, ki te upoko o tika e kui mā e koro mā i te pō, moi mai, moi mai ngā. I au wai maku aku mihi, ka rewa ki te ahu pupuhi, ki ngā kokonga o te whare, ki ngā kokonga o te motu, o te ao, ki ngā tini mate o te whānau e nohoana nei, ki a koe e te whaia mō tēnei pō, Te whaia mō tēnei kaupapa, tēnā koe, tēnā rātātā, tēnā rātātā, ki o koutou tini mate ko a haere mai, ki tēnei taumata, hei whakanuia, ki tō haerenga anehera. Nō reira, e te tohunga, e ngā kaumatua, e ngā huia o te whānau nei, tēnā koutou, nau mai. Hara mai, whakatau mai, kei roto te whare wāna o o tāko ki pōneke. Ka tuku te mihi anō ki o tātou nei manutaki, o tātou nei tino rangatira o te whare wāna o tāko, o te haura, te kura haura, ki a paura, ki te tāina mai ki tō kaha, ki te tautoko te kaupapa nei tēnā koe, tēnā kōrua a ena. Ko tō hoki, e ngā kaimahi o te whare nei, e mihi kauna tēnei ki o koutou, ki te ahi ki te tautoko, te pō whakahirihira mō Jean Haysmith. Nō reira, hei whakapō potu tēnei wā, ki te tere tere mai te pō nei, ki te mea nunui o te pō ki a koe, ki tō kōrero, ki tō haerenga mai rā nō ki konei, a nehe rā, Ko ena te huarahi, i hanga mai nō te whānau, i hanga mai nō te hāpuri o kweika, ka tira he mihi aua tēnei, nō te iwi o tarana ki whānau, o ngā ki tō ranga tira, ki tō mahi ranga tira. Nō reira, e te whaia, tēnā koe, tēnā kota, tēnā kota, a kia ora mai tātou whānau. Rere tō tika, rere pā. Ladies and gentlemen, just a short translation from the beautiful words of our great ancestors, of our navigators that brought our ancestors to Aotearoa to make landfall that is most important to know and to put into your mind where you wish to go. 
uh, and envisage that land that you, you see, then you will make land for. That is the karakia that I use in every inaugural professorial lecture to remind us that we always go to the heart of our kaupapa. And for this evening, for Jean Hay Smith, uh, for her cordial, um, we're very excited because it is something that is um, important to all cultures, but particularly for Māori, I think it's one of our most important, um, uh, I guess, um, issues that have faced us, and we wish to uh, strengthen our standing in our whare tangata and the well-being of our wahine, our whaia. So, nō reira, tēnā kūta, kia ora mai tata, from all of us on Ngāti Tōr, of our Manutaki, our, de our head of school and dean, uh, and also from Paul Brunton, Professor Paul Brunton, who has come up and to support us also, and Anna Rinta. Uh, tēnā kūta, kia ora mai tata. Welcome everybody, my name is William Levac, I am the Dean of uh, the University of Otago, Wellington. I am extremely delighted to be in the position of introducing our guest speaker, our speaker, not guest speaker, our speaker today, Dean Wesker, <laughs> our special speaker. I consider uh, Jean to be um, uh, both a good friend and a valued colleague. Um, I've been uh, in the extremely fortunate position of uh, working with Jean on a number of projects ranging across teaching and research since 2006, when she first joined the Rehabilitation Teaching and Research Unit uh, in the Department of Medicine um, here in the University of Otago, Wellington, um, Te Whariwanaga Otago Ki Ponake. Um, ironically, both Jean and I weren't living in Wellington at the time. Jean is down in Dunedin and I was in, in the Wairapa at the time. I myself have directly benefited from her knowledge of scientific methodology, particularly in the murkier corners of systematic reviews. Um, and I've greatly enjoyed our work together um, with supervising masters and PhD um, students. However, um, Jean's work at the University of Otago dates well before um, my first meetings with her. Uh, originally trained as a physiotherapist in Auckland in 1984, um, Jean worked in a range, a variety of uh, clinical positions in New Zealand and overseas before moving into academic and clinical teaching roles at um, the University of East London in the UK. Um, Jean returned to New Zealand uh, and joined the University of Otago in 1996, uh, working initially as a lecturer for the School of Physiotherapy, 
Um, since then, Jean has worked in a range of positions for the university, increasingly moving into positions of, of leadership. Uh, for six years, for example, Jean was the um, Associate Dean of graduates, uh, Graduate Studies for the whole of the Division of Health Sciences. Um, this uh, was a significant contribution to the university, uh, which included um, the wrangling of university policies, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the mentoring and uh, sometimes mediating between students and supervisors, uh, as well as chairing uh, the board which provided, provides um, gov uh, academic governance for um, uh, postgraduate, all, all postgraduate programs within the Division of Health Sciences. Jean's also contributed um, as a member of the University Senate um, on the Academic uh, Leadership Advisory Group uh, and has been heavily involved in the uh, mentoring of other women in uh, academic positions, um, a role which has included the co-convening of the Women in Leadership Targo um, group for five years. Uh, Jean was also a founding member of um, Physiotherapy Research Society in the UK. Um, she's a life member of the New Zealand Continents Association and a member of the International Continents Association. Uh, but Jean is um, particularly known internationally for her expertise in women's health research, um, especially in the field of continents, and we'll be hearing a bit more about this um, today. Um, and, and also um, as a scientist in the areas, uh, the methodological areas of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. In fact, um, Jean was a reviewer uh, and a contributor to the, uh, the work of the Cochrane Collaboration in the 1990s before it was even called the Cochrane Collaboration, when it was just a, a group of like-minded academics and, and clinicians. Um, and Cochrane has since gone on to become a premier organisation that champions evidence-based healthcare practice internationally. Um, it's a valued and trusted sort of source of that sort of information um, and to this organisation Jean continues to be a significant and influential contributor. Um, Jean's been uh, invited to be a speaker in multiple universities internationally including, I've got a list here, the University of Exeter, University of Stirling, University of Birmingham, Monash University, the University of Montreal, uh, Glasgow Caledonian University and University of Central Lancashire. Um, she's delivered invited and keynote speakers, uh, speeches in uh, the US, in Thailand, in Australia, and of course um, here in Aotearoa. Uh, she's contributed as a named investigator to national and international research collaborations that have been associated with over $100 million in research grant funding, and this work has led to the production of um, well in excess of, of 100 publications. So if I had to pick one word to describe, um, which is difficult, one word to describe Jean's uh, contribution and work over the years, I think that word would be collegial. Uh, she is the embodiment of the Whakatauki mena mahi tahi tātou mō te oranga o te katoa. We must all work together for the well-being of all of us. Uh, therefore, it's my great pleasure and privilege to invite Professor Jean Hay smith um, to the podium to deliver her inaugural professorial lecture. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Tēnā te katoa. Tēnā hoki nā iwi o te pāni nei. Ati ati awa a nati toa e mihiana. I whanau mai o e te awaroa, me mihi katika ki nati whatua, nā rātou o i whakamaru. Ko a tuanui te maunga, ko kaipara te awa, ko kaipara te moana, ko nati whatua te mana whenua. Kei waitaha o ho e noho ana, no ingarangi, airangi, Tia mana me kotirana o kotupuna. Kiti taha o tuku mama, ko west, ko Gordon nahapu. Kiti taha o tuku papa, ko Rudevold, ko Hay Smith nahapu. Ko Jean Hay Smith toko ingoa, nori ra tena koto tena koto tena koto katoa. So greetings especially to the iwi of this region, Te Ate Awa and Ngāti Toa, I acknowledge you. I was born in Te Awaroa, I acknowledge Ngāti Whātua who sheltered me there in my youth. And uh, this picture I was holding in the advertisement shows four generations of women in my family and they too were sheltered by Ngāti Whātua. Uh, Atuanui is the Maunga, Kaipara the Awa, Kaipara the Moana, and Ngāti Whātua the Mana Whenua. I now live in Waitaha, 
and my ancestors are from England, Ireland, Germany and Scotland. And on my mother's side, West and Gordon are the hapu. And on my father's side, Rudevold and Haysmith are the hapu. My name is Jean Haysmith. Greetings to you all. Whoops, that one. This quotation from Catherine Mansfield was part of the dedication of my PhD thesis when I handed it in in 2003. And it's somewhat of an irony that I chose this because when I interviewed for the physiotherapy program at ATI in 1981, the interview panel asked me a hypothetical question, which was about a hot air balloon with a basket beneath and four people in it. I was one of them. Catherine Mansfield was another. Ernest Rutherford and Edmund Hillary were also in the basket. <laughs> And I, the basket was losing height and I had to throw someone out and provide a justification and it wasn't allowed to be me. <laughs> and Catherine Mansfield was the first person to leave the basket. <laughs> now a PhD is an obvious beginning to a research career but my career in education and in women's health began a long time before that. This is my mother seated on the cushion and here today. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-great-grandmother. Little Granny, on your right, was four foot 11 and a half inches, the same height as Queen Victoria, she used to say, and she was born illegitimate in the United Kingdom and was growing up illiterate. She learned that you could learn to read by going to Sunday school, which is what she did, and she was working as a housemaid when the other housemaid she was working with fell in love with the footman and decided not to come to New Zealand, and so Granny with alacrity said, well, I'll go, and off she came as a young and single woman. Her daughter Eleanor, or Nora, standing at the back, could certainly read. A story told about Nora is that she invited people to morning tea, and they arrived to find her with her nose in a book, surrounded by the breakfast dishes that weren't done. And I think my family would say similar stories could be told about me. Hayden, on the left, is my gran. She was a university graduate of geography. She really wanted to be a graduate of geology, but she was forbidden because women were not allowed to go down the mines. She was a teacher, passionate about the well-being and education of children. My mother, Wynne, is also a teacher. And Wynne had a huge influence on my education, but perhaps more than that, and unwittingly, I suspect, she was the influence on my clinical career in women's health. At the age of 15, Wynne got a job for me as a nurse aide at the Helensville Obstetric Hospital. It was a rural hospital run by matron Glenn Hoare, a midwife and a nurse. And I worked there under her leadership from the time I was 15 until I stopped working there at the age of 21 after my physiotherapy training ended. And by the time I left, the health and well-being of women was as much in my blood as was education. After I trained in New Zealand as a physiotherapist, I worked here for a little and then I went to London where I lived for nearly 10 years. And in that time, I worked at The London, as we called it then, um, and I met two very influential women there. Professor Wendy Sav Savage was an eminent obstetrician and a very strong political voice for women. And as soon as Wendy worked out who I was and that I was likely to be there for longer than five minutes, she started to refer women to me with painful sex after childbirth called dyspyunia. Now, I didn't have a clue what to do, I don't think Wendy did either, but Wendy's opinion was that I was a physiotherapist, some of this problem might be painful scarring, and therefore I might know something that I could do, and she thought that would be better than going for a surgical option first. And Wendy also used to say to me, well, my woman will tell you anything if you ask. And so this was the idea of the surveys that then became part of my master's degree. I also met Jill Mantle, a world-leading obstetric physiotherapist. She visited the London to supervise students there. And she encouraged me to consider doing a higher degree. Jill, when you watch this later, thank you. 
You were a mentor, a friend, a colleague, and you were the one who really set me on the academic path. Thank you. So what we found in this master's thesis is that women actually very commonly experience this condition after birth and that general practitioners who were principally responsible for um, postnatal care uh, at that time in the United Kingdom, it wasn't really on their radar. And there were some physiotherapists treating the condition um, and one of the most common treatments they were using was something called therapeutic ultrasound. Now, this was very fashionable in physiotherapy at the time. It was being used for rotator cuffs and tennis elbows and sprained ankles and any manner of things. And this was really my beginning of the realization that lots of treatments were used in women's health without much evidence. I was far from the first and certainly one of the least eminent people to realize this. In 1979, a very famous epidemiologist called Archie Cochrane awarded a wooden spoon to obstetrics for the poorest use of science, especially randomized trials in establishing effective treatments. Now, the wooden spoon was a Cambridge University institution. Um, it was awarded to the scholar in any year with the lowest mathematics score, um, <laughs> suggesting they would be better off as a chef or a cook than a scholar. I'm pleased to say it was a practice that ceased in the early 1900s. <laughs> but Archie Cochrane was critical of healthcare in general, not just obstetrics, and he said, it's surely a great criticism of our profession that we have not organised a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty adapted periodically of all relevant randomised control trials. Now, he was interested in randomised control trials because these were considered sort of the gold standard way of testing the effectiveness of healthcare interventions, and in many settings they still are. Named for Archie Cochrane, by Professor Sir Ian Chalmers there on the left, was the Cochrane Centre, which was set up in Oxford. And it later became the Cochrane Collaboration, as William said, now simply called Cochrane. One of the things that Cochrane does is organise these critical summaries of randomised controlled trials. And a system, what a systematic review does, because that's what we call these critical summaries, is essentially use very explicit methods for finding um, randomised trials um, and critiquing randomised trials and synthesising the data from randomised trials. And this is the methodology that became the foundation of my research career. In the 1990s, I did my first Cochrane Systematic Reviews, mentored by Ian and also Professor Mary Renfrew, a midwife. I authored reviews on enemas before labour, perineal shaving, routine episiotomy, amongst other practices, all of which I'd seen at Helensville Obstetric Hospital and were still in widespread use. And we found no evidence for any of these things. And I'm pleased to say that perhaps I had a small part, therefore, to play in the cessation of these unnecessary practices during the labours of women. It was through the Cochrane collaboration that I met Professor Adrian Grant. That's the tiny little portrait picture up there. Adrian, like me, doesn't like his photograph taken. Um, and through Adrian, while I was still living in England, I met Don Wilson and Peter Herbison in New Zealand. Under Adrian's mentorship and leadership, Don, Peter and I became foundation editors of Cochrane Incontinence. And this is a group that creates these critical evidence summaries for people who experience bladder and bowel conditions. With this slide, we're back in New Zealand and my PhD, for which Don, who's here in the audience, and Peter became supervisors, and also Professor Emerita Jean Fleming, who's also in the audience here today. I thank them all for seeing me through. <laughs> it wasn't always easy. The thesis included two systematic reviews that I'll talk about in a moment, and also a randomised trial of pelvic floor muscle training. Now, the person pictured here is research coordinator Gay Ellis, who I know is with a whole lot of people at the Department of Women's and Children's Health in Dunedin right now watching this. And Gay, I thank you for many years of research support. 
Pelvic floor muscle training is repeated voluntary contractions of your pelvic floor muscles. They go from your pubic bone at the front to your tailbone at the back and sideways to the sitting bones that you're sitting on at the moment. And they fill in the base of the pelvis. They provide support to your pelvic organs to prevent prolapse. And they provide a lift and squeeze function around the outlets from your bladder and bowel to maintain your continence. And it's this intervention, pelvic floor muscle training, that was the central intervention of interest in most of my research career. Now, in my PhD, I did a randomised trial about pelvic floor muscle training. More than 300 women were screened for that trial. More than 120 women took part in the trial. And by the end of that time, I had heard so many stories about living with a bladder problem and trying to do these exercises called pelvic floor muscle exercises that I felt compelled to put a qualitative study in my PhD. What I learned from the 20 women I interviewed was how long and how hard they had worked to keep their incontinence private. And how silenced they were by a whole set of circumstances. Societal norms about you need adult levels of control and you can't admit to this condition. When seeking help, health professionals who didn't pick up on those little cues that someone was asking for help. And actually sometimes health professionals hearing about it but saying this is normal for women your age. Normal for women who've had babies, there's nothing we can do. In contrast, for the woman who took part in the trial, and the ones I interviewed anyway, the power, the sense of confidence in themselves to understand more about their bodies and to finally understand these mysterious exercises that they were supposed to do that nobody had really explained to them. I remember one woman telling me about how she had told her general practitioner about her bladder problem. And the way she remembered this was that the general practitioner had sat back in their chair with their arms crossed and said, well, I suppose you could try those exercises. Just lift up and down while you're standing at the sink. This woman had done toe raises while washing the dishes for more than 20 years. So this is the first of the Cochrane Reviews that was part of my PhD and uh, first published in 2001, several iterations since, and Professor Chantal Dumoulin is now the fabulous first author of this review. Our most recent update included 31 randomised trials involving more than 1,800 women from 14 different countries. And the review contains something called a meta-analysis, and this is a statistical pooling of data. It gives sort of more power than small individual studies. Now what the pool data show was that women with stress urinary incontinence who received pelvic floor muscle training were eight times more likely to say they were cured of their stress urinary incontinence than women who didn't get pelvic floor muscle training. Now this review is actually a very important one because it's an evidence summary that underpins a lot of clinical practice guidelines around the world, including here in New Zealand, but also in the United Kingdom and other places and says that pelvic floor muscle training should be offered as first-line therapy to women with stress, uncomplicated stress urinary incontinence. And I don't mean the sort of pelvic floor muscle training that leads to toe raises for 20 years. <laughs> I mean the sort of pelvic floor muscle training where correct contraction is taught and then confirmed, and a progressive exercise training program is prescribed and supervised. And if anyone's looking for such a type of health professional, it can be found at the Continents New Zealand website. This is the second Cochrane review from my PhD, um, and I'm in the process of updating this very slowly. Um, the reason I want to update it is I sort of want a forum to actually say, don't do a lot of this sort of research. Um, and that's an irony because actually this is exactly the sort of research I did in my PhD. I did a trial that compared two approaches to pelvic floor muscle training. And as a physiotherapist, that was a very appealing thing to do because of course I wanted to find out what the optimal exercise program was. However, the previous review I've just talked about gives plenty of examples of effective pelvic floor muscle training programs. And the problem with comparing two pelvic floor muscle training treatments is they've probably got the same mechanism of action. And they're probably not going to be a very big difference in effect between them. 
And in fact, to find a small difference with any confidence, you're going to need a very large trial, and they're costly, and they're time consuming. And even if you find a statistically significant small difference, the question is, is it clinically important? So what if you did this massive expensive trial and found the difference between the two groups was three fewer le leakage episodes every week, but actually women are e leaking 15 and 16 times a week? It's probably not a big important clinical difference to find. I do think quite a lot of time and money is therefore wasted on exactly the sort of red herring research I did in my own PhD. And this uh, invited commentary here on the bottom right was one I was invited to write by Lancet Global Health last year. And in it, I say pretty much the same thing. And the reason I was able to say it was I was actually commenting on an absolutely outstanding piece of pelvic floor muscle training research where they hadn't wasted our time. What they'd done was they'd taken an intervention of pelvic floor muscle training of known effectiveness based on those systematic reviews I've just talked about and they applied it in a completely different setting. They went to rural Bangladesh, the women were illiterate, they were seen in groups by trained healthcare assistants, they used a very innovative way of finding out how often these women were leaking, they had ribbons underneath their saris that they tied knots in. They showed a difference from this intervention compared to no intervention, a truly outstanding piece of research exactly the sort of research we need because it was done in, it's, it's different from the usually white, usually literate, usually high income country, usually highly trained healthcare professionals, which are the sort of trials we usually see. Now this is a sort of exception to my red herring rule <laughs> because it actually is a comparison of two approaches to pelvic floor muscle training with biofeedback and without biofeedback. Rosaline um, Herreshe was the um, student who did this. Uh, she came to New Zealand and, and did this review with me. Um, I think this is an important question because actually biofeedback has a whole lot of expenses associated with it. So there's the expense of creating them, marketing them, buying them. There are the less direct costs to women to whom these are marketed and they buy them, but they're believing they're buying something that's going to help them, and it's possible it doesn't. Um, and when they're used clinically, there's all the gloves and all the bits and pieces, all the environmental impact of all that plastic and all that metal. So I think this is probably an important question to answer. The actual original Cochrane Review included 24 trials, about 1,500 women, and did find that biofeedback um, led to more reports of cure and improvement. But there was an important problem with all those trials. Nearly all the biofeedback trials gave women more contact with healthcare professionals. And it might have been that that was the important thing, not the biofeedback. So, our uh, dream team led by the fabulous Professor Suzanne Hagen, and I was a privilege to be included in this, completed a very large trial in the United Kingdom. 600 women were randomised to get pelvic floor muscle training with biofeedback or not, and these findings were published in the BMJ last month. And both groups got the same pelvic floor muscle training programme, the same number of clinic appointments, and the same duration of clinic appointment and the only difference was by feedback or not. At 24 months, no important differences between the groups for the severity of urinary incontinence, and so we believe uh, biofeedback can't be recommended for routine practice. And this is the last of the pelvic floor muscle training reviews I'm going to talk about. It too has been through several iterations. I was the first author a few times, and now I work with Associate Professor Stephanie Woodley. The updated version was published this year, summarising evidence from 46 trials, more than 10,000 women from 21 different countries. And the message I want to pull out from this review is slightly different. It's about prevention. Up till now, everything I've said is about treating existing symptoms. What the pool data from this review show is that women who are continent at the start of pregnancy and do antenatal pelvic floor muscle training 
are 62% less likely to leak by the end of their pregnancy. That's about one fewer out of three women leaking by the end of pregnancy. There's some duration of effect, it lasts a bit after pregnancy, and it seems that this effect is bigger than if you start your training after the delivery. But the current maternity care system in New Zealand means this potentially effective therapy is mostly unavailable to women. Because physiotherapists who used to be responsible for this are no longer part of primary maternity care. The intervention could be a public health fence at the top of the incontinence cliff, and it's missing. Now, there are many reasons why implementing pelvic floor muscle training in antenatal care is problematic. And the Appeal Program Grant, led by Professor Christine MacArthur from the University of Birmingham, is looking at this. Bottom left is one of the first pieces of um, research that we've published from this program grant. And it's a synthesis about existing literature looking at the challenges and the opportunities in the antenatal care pathway for implementing pelvic floor muscle exercises. And what this review finds is that it's actually unrealistic to expect midwives and women to implement this without substantial change in policy and the service delivery environment. With the loss of physiotherapists from maternity care, midwives have been handed the pelvic floor muscle training baton. But they've been handed it for everything. Gestational diabetes, gestational weight gain, intimate partner violence, vaccination, smoking cessation, everything. And the system within which those midwives are working has not changed to enable them to take up all those batons and do everything the way they would think that it ought to be done. And they are the ideal people. They are the people accompanying women through their pregnancies and immediately after their births. It would be great if they were able to do it. In parallel, we did the study on the bottom right. So this was sort of real time. We wanted something contemporary. And we um, were observing women and midwives in clinics to find out about the contemporary culture of pelvic floor muscle training. And we found that although midwives and some women um, thought that pelvic floor muscle exercises were important, they weren't prioritised. Uh, there was a lack of confidence amongst midwives to teach pelvic floor muscle exercises or to manage urinary incontinence in the antenatal care pathway. And women lack confidence to ask about these mysterious exercises, even if they knew about them, and they lacked confidence to ask about any leakage problems they were having. The culture included this lack of consistent guidelines, policy or system support at local or national levels uh, to give any priority to pelvic floor muscle exercises. Now the next part of appeal is working with midwives on a training package and testing it in a pilot cluster randomised trial, but actually the action needs to be higher up. So you may recall the title of one of the papers on the previous page was Are You Doing Your Pelvic Floor? And actually a systematic evidence has accrued about the potential benefits of pelvic floor. This is the question really that's become more important to me. Why, for instance, is it possible for us to remember to brush our teeth twice a day, but very difficult to remember to do eight to 10 pelvic floor muscle contractions twice a day? Now, any expertise I've got in this area of health behaviour and adherence, I credit to Professor Sarah Dean from the University of Exeter. Thank you, Sarah, a wonderful colleague and friend. In 2011, with Sarah, um, I was part of a faculty of experts looking at this question of adherence and pelvic floor muscle training, and I authored the paper there on the right with Sarah and others, where we synthesised evidence from qualitative studies, um, people's experiences of pelvic floor muscle training, and we found a number of influences on that, um, and these map very well to a behavioural theory um, called Capability, Opportunity, Motivation and Behaviour Model. Essentially what we found is people, before contacting a health professional, lack capability for these exercises. They were a bit mysterious, they didn't know what they were, they lacked the physical skills to actually do them. When they did find a health professional, and were starting to think about pelvic floor muscle exercises, they had to keep this front of mind. They were trying to develop automaticity or habit to do them. 
The problem was that it was very difficult to keep them front of mind because they lacked opportunity. And the reason many of these people lacked opportunity is they were juggling so many priorities. For women in particular, a new baby, other children, working part-time, often more than one part-time job or full-time, caring for an elderly parent, caring for a sick sibling, and many other things, which actually made it incredibly difficult to keep something like this front of mind. And more recently, Sarah and I joined with Associate Professor Helena Frawley from the University of Melbourne um, to write about why therapists therefore need to consider the behavioural support as much as the exercise prescription when they're thinking about pelvic floor muscle training, because really we need to start thinking about that in our evidence summaries as much as the exercises themselves. Now this next paper is a work in progress. Um, we're investigating about 20 years of qualitative research on urinary incontinence and we're trying to think about how urinary incontinence is constructed. That is, what do the societal norms tell us this thing is? What do health professional norms tell us this thing is? How does this get, get into consciousness, if you like? And in this project I've worked uh, with Associate Professor Chris Jay um, and Nurse and Methodologist Professor, Associate Professor Carol Bouge. Um, and I want to thank them both for a lot of learning and a lot of fun. Um, so reading more than 30 papers we've included in this review, one of the things that's really struck me is how most of those papers begin exactly the same way. Urinary incontinence is common for women. Urinary incontinence is a problem. And women don't seek help for this problem. I've written the exact same introduction myself, actually. Working with Chris, who's a medical anthropologist, and Carol, has meant that I've stood back and asked, so what does this way of framing the research mean for the research? The what does the world view of the researcher bring in or keep out? And how does the methodology influence how you collect the data, how you interpret the data, and therefore what you find? Now, I'm not saying this research we're reviewing is wrong or unhelpful, but I am saying the repeated narrative is so taken for granted that alternative explanations are excluded. What, for instance, if women have worked out such effective self-management strategies that their incontinence is not a problem right now amongst all the other priorities in their life. And contacting a health professional would not be a good use of their time, their resource, financial resource, energy resource. And actually it's quite possible a health professional couldn't tell them anything they don't already know about how to manage this well right now. So this alternative reading shows women as resourceful and resilient rather than recalcitrant, because a lot of those research paper introductions are saying, you naughty people, you, you should be seeking help for this problem, and you're not. So I want to think more broadly about the well-being of women, taking an anthropological, more sociological view, the misogyny of science and medicine, it's pretty clear to see. Women have been excluded from research. Women's anatomy, physiology and behaviour has been considered deviant. And at other times, women have been experimented on. And beyond the unfortunate experiment at National Women's Hospital, which I hope never, ever leaves our national consciousness, if you're in any doubt about poor science and the harm of fashion in obstetrics, then this paper by David Grimes is a pretty salutary read. It's available open access. And it hasn't stopped. The latest scientific scandal in women's health is the harm that's been done by the implementation or the implantation of mesh in incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse surgeries. And I'm not saying this to put women off surgery. There are safe and effective operations and there are good surgeons. What must stop? is the widespread adoption of new treatments in practice 
which outrun the evidence of their effects for women and the safety for women. It's time for me to spread my wings. Uh, it's time for me to move away from my comfort zone of mid-age women and pelvic floor muscle training and systematic reviews and randomised trials. A few years ago, I had the great privilege of working with Professor Lois Thomas, who recently re re retired from the University of Central Lancashire, and she had a great research programme on incontinence after stroke. And this has given me the push I needed to consider research for people with bladder and bowel problems after stroke. So working with Rochelle Martin, who's in the audience today, we've completed a small study where we uh, investigated what might support stroke survivors with bladder and bowel problems uh, to take part in their social roles inside and outside their home. And this lovely diagram on the right, thanks Rochelle, summarises the findings. I've just realised it looks a bit like a bowel, don't you think? <laughs> um, uh, and these are the findings. If a stroke survivor is offered an ongoing conversation with a healthcare professional about incontinence, then they have the opportunity to actually reflect on the trial and error learning they're doing with the management options they've come up with and the management options that health professional might have offered them. Then they can work out how to use those resources flexibly and with confidence inside and outside their home. And that works as incontinence management because the process fosters shared decision making, co-management and efficacy between the stroke survivor and their whanau, their carers, for this moving in and outside the home. And Rochelle and I are now exploring a bit more research on this topic, particularly with Nicola Kays and Felicity Bright from AUT. There are lots and lots of people I've not been able to mention. Um, my research interests, as you can see, are far ranging across the sphere of rehabilitation as well as women's health. And I would like to thank all these collaborators and these collaborations because it's their work as much as mine that has created the portfolio that means I stand here. I particularly want to thank thesis students who are mentioned here because being part of your research journey is a huge privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Academic careers are collaborative. I'm an ordinary academic, I research, I teach, I have some service roles. Um, and mentioned on that first couple of lines there are people who've had a particular influence on my career at Otago, who have offered me leadership opportunity, who have role modelled leadership for me, have supported my leadership and have given me leadership training and I thank them. I particularly also want to mention my fantastic colleagues at the Rehabilitation Teaching and Research Unit to Whare Whakamatutu, Elliot Bell, Fee Graham, Rob Griffith, William Levac, Rochelle Martin, Libby Maguire, William Taylor and Mark Weatherall. These are my current colleagues, what a fantastic bunch of people, um, and we have a wonderful department head in Anna Ranta. Thank you, Anna. There are also past members of RTRU that I also thank. They're not shown here, but they've had just as much influence on my career. Now the thanks that come from the heart. I had the opportunity earlier today to thank uh, my closest supporters, my whanau um, at a high tea at the Boltons, and I thank them again for everything they have done for me and for all those members of family who are watching from the United Kingdom and around New Zealand and other places, I thank you too. I also want to thank my beloved husband, Simon. I certainly wouldn't be standing here without his support. And lastly, two wise women. Judith Ann O'Sullivan, thank you for more than 20 years of being a light to my path. And my adored Aunt Emily, who died suddenly last year. She's with me always. She's here now. She loved me so much and she gifted me so much love. She's a very big part of who I am. I want to end with a marvellous Māori Fokotoki. In Māori cosmology, Hini Ahuoni is the first woman created from the clay of Papatuanuki.
Mi aro tika ti ka ha o hini ahuoni. Pay heed to the mana of woman. Kia ora tato. people like you out there looking after us, all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you've contributed to the university, to the RTRU, and also the Department of Medicine. And over the last just couple of years that I've worked with you, I've really valued you as a friend and it's just an absolutely treasured advisor in your role as head of the RTRU as part of our senior academic leadership team. Um, so, I have a small gift for you to commemorate this important event in your career. 